Um, now that we've talked about the difference between weather and climate, um, let's jump in and talk about what the atmosphere actually is. So, um, first off, I want you to know yeah, what the atmosphere is. Um, I also want you to know how the atmosphere is held in place and how this influences air pressure. Um, so we're going to talk about the key reason why our atmosphere doesn't just float away. Um, I'll give you a hint, it's the same reason why we don't just float away. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the key gases in the atmosphere. So what's actually in the air that we're breathing? All right, let's do this. So first off, the atmosphere is the envelope of air that's wrapped around our Earth. It's this relatively thin layer that's wrapped around our Earth. Um, and the reason why I say it's a relatively thin layer is because when compared to something like um, the crust of the Earth, well, I mean, the crust is relatively thin, but looking at the mantle um, or the overall size of the solid Earth, um, the atmosphere is relatively thin in comparison. And our atmosphere is held in place by gravity. So the same thing that is um, planting this computer to my desk or planting my body into this chair, keeping me on the ground, is the same thing that keeps the atmosphere on the ground. So yay gravity. Um, but this also gives the atmosphere an interesting consequence. Not only is the atmosphere held in place by gravity, but most of the atmosphere's molecules are near the surface of the Earth. So the atmosphere is not evenly spread out with height. No, almost all of the atmosphere, all, the, all of the atmosphere's molecules are near the surface of the Earth. And this has some pretty interesting consequences on air pressure. Um, but first off, the atmosphere, even though it is hundreds of miles thick, 99% of its molecules are confined to the lowest 30 kilometers. And that's why I say that it's a relatively thin atmosphere because 99% of its molecules are in the lowest 30 kilometers. That's approximately 20 miles. Um, think about how long it would take for you to drive 20 miles from where you're at right now. Um, I'm in Cupertino, California. It would take me probably 30 minutes to drive 20 miles. I guess it depends on the direction I go, but um, it's not really a long distance. And so 99% of the atmosphere's molecules are confined to that lowest 30 kilometers. And as a result, compared to the rest of the Earth, the atmosphere seems very thin. And this image right here actually can illustrate that. So this was taken from the space shuttle Atlantis as it was docked with the International Space Station. And what it actually shows you is down here, you have the Earth. Up here is space. This thin blue line is the atmosphere. And what you actually notice is that the line is the brightest near the surface, and it's a lot thinner the higher up you go. And again, that's because all, most of the molecules of the atmosphere are hanging out near the ground. <clears throat> Now, with that said, what molecules are particularly in the atmosphere? Well, obviously oxygen, and that's essential for life on Earth, um, but there are other gases in the atmosphere that play some really key roles. Let's talk about these. The atmosphere gives us oxygen to breathe. Without the atmosphere, or with a much thinner atmosphere, we wouldn't be able to breathe. And again, because air molecules crowd near the surface of the Earth, the higher up you go in atmosphere, the thinner the air is. Which is why if you've ever driven up to, say, Lake Tahoe, or if you've ever gone up to um, a really tall mountain peak, it might seem a little bit harder to breathe. It's simply because there's less air. There's, there's, less, there's fewer air molecules in the atmosphere. Um, so the atmosphere gives us air to breathe. It also keeps us warm. Um, there are these gases in the atmosphere called greenhouse gases, which somewhat get a bad rap, and I'll talk about that more in a moment, but they actually keep us warm. Another important thing that the atmosphere does 
is it acts almost like a filtration system, allowing water to cycle from the ocean to land. And this gives us fresh water. I'll talk more about the water cycle in a little bit, and then we'll talk about it much more in depth in a few weeks when we talk about humidity. Um, and the atmosphere also helps balance Earth's uneven temperatures. Um, I'm sure that you've experienced this. There are some locations that are much colder than others and some locations that are much warmer than others. Well, if it wasn't for our atmosphere, those differences would be much more extreme. The equator would be much warmer, the poles would be much colder. And so the atmosphere actually helps serve in balancing that out. So what's actually in our atmosphere? Well, there are two types of gases I want to talk about. Fixed gases and variable gases. Fixed gases are gases whose concentrations pretty much stay the same. They don't differ much from place to place. They don't differ much from moment to moment. And these gases are also the most abundant gases, meaning they have the highest concentration. Most of what our atmosphere is is made up of these gases. And the gases are nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and neon. Well, comp uh, contrary to popular belief, oxygen is not the most abundant gas. The most abundant gas is nitrogen, making up 78% of the air we breathe. So right now, the air that's surrounding you, the air that you're breathing in, is 78% nitrogen. Another 21% is oxygen. And another 0.9% is argon. So 99% of the air you're breathing right now is made up of these three things. Made up of these three things. Um, and then there are these variable gases. And there are many different variable gases in our atmosphere. These are the three main ones I want to talk about. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane. These can change a lot from place to place, from time to time. Um, and so these really depend on different weather conditions. For example, if it's really humid outside, water vapor is going to have a much higher percentage. It may be closer to 4% of what's in the air. On the other hand, in most cases, that 4% that is really extreme, by the way. In most cases, it's going to be lower. And when it's lower, um, the air is not as hot, or sorry, not as hot, not as humid. The air is a lot drier. As I mentioned in the last video, bloopers will happen. Sorry. Um, but yeah, not as hot. Uh, take two. Not as humid. Um, and so, yeah, when you get lower water vapor concentrations, yeah, the air is just not as humid. Um, carbon dioxide, this one's actually been rising. Even though that seems like a very low concentration, it's almost doubled in the last 120 years. And then the same thing's been happening with methane. We've noticed a big up, uptick in the amount of methane. What's concerning about methane though is that methane is a very, very potent greenhouse gas. It's about 20 times as potent as carbon dioxide. So even a slight increase in methane can cause a big change. But yeah, if you were to take a look at a recipe for atmospheric air, this is what you get. 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.9% argon, and then everything else is less than 0.1%. Um, the only thing that really can become a little more abundant is water vapor on very humid days. <clears throat> well, I just talked for a second about greenhouse gases, but what on earth is a greenhouse gas? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is greenhouse gases are actually our misunderstood friends in many ways. I'm sure you've seen videos and have heard policies where people have said, oh, greenhouse gases are horrible. We need to get rid of them. They're terrible. We never, you know, never deal with them. They're bad. Um, I'm actually going to put that myth to rest. It is false. Greenhouse gases are good. Greenhouse gases are good. And here's why they're good. Greenhouse gases are transparent to sunlight. So they behave like the windows in your car. They let sunlight in. 
and that heats our Earth up. That's a good thing. Without greenhouse gases, that sunlight might not be able to get in. But the other thing that they do is once that heat is in, it's harder for it to escape. So greenhouse gases let heat in, but they don't let heat out. And that keeps the Earth warm. So that's a good thing. And because of greenhouse gases, the average temperature of our Earth, so this is an average temperature with just one number based on the averages taken all around the world, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. If we had no greenhouse gases, it is believed that our approximate temperature would be around zero degrees Fahrenheit. So substantially colder. And in fact, this temperature would re render much of the Earth uninhabitable. So yay, greenhouse gases. Well, here's the thing with greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are good. But think about your favorite food. Imagine if you ate it every day for breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner. You'd probably get sick of it. Um, and if it's something that's not necessarily good for you, you could also end up with health consequences. Well, what happened? Well, too much of a good thing. Well, the same thing has happened with greenhouse gases. The more greenhouse gases our Earth gets, the hotter we get. So the more greenhouse gases we put into our atmosphere, the warmer the atmosphere gets. That is why greenhouse gases are a bad thing in that case. It's too much of a good thing. But again, overall, they're good. Without them, it'd be a lot colder than it currently is. A lot of the radiation that enters the Earth would immediately escape and the Earth would stay very cold. But because we have greenhouse gases, some of that radiation, particularly what's called infrared radiation, which we'll talk about in the next module, um, actually gets absorbed, keeping our Earth warm. But again, as I said, the thicker the, at, or the, the, thicker the greenhouse gases, more greenhouse gases mean more heat getting tra trapped in. We don't want that. We want to stay where we're at. And that is the concern now. So what are some key greenhouse gases? Well, there's actually several gases that behave like greenhouse gases. They include water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, and nitrous oxide. With that said, let me talk a little bit about water vapor. Water vapor leaves the atmosphere almost as quickly as it enters the atmosphere. Humidity changes a lot from day to day, and um, the water vapor content changes a lot from day to day. So water vapor doesn't really hang around much. So we're not too worried about water vapor. The same thing with ozone and nitrous oxide. These are put in here primarily by us, by human activities, but they quickly wash out as well. So we're not as worried about them either. Here's what we're worried about. We're worried about carbon dioxide and methane. And the reason why we're concerned about these two is, first off, they have a long lifespan in the atmosphere. Meaning when a molecule of carbon dioxide enters the atmosphere, it can stay there for over 100 years. That's scary. Methane, not as long, but methane has one other thing about it that's even scarier. Methane can actually hold 20 times as much energy as carbon dioxide. So even though methane doesn't hang around as long, it's very potent. And so these are the greenhouse gases we're worried with the most. Carbon dioxide is the most concerning greenhouse gas. It's the one that has experienced the biggest increase. It has played the biggest role in warmer temperatures. And carbon dioxide is a byproduct of burning anything that's organic. So if you've ever taken an organic chemistry class or anything like that, 
Um, carbon dioxide is a byproduct of what's called oxidation. Basically, organic material is very heavy in carbon. And carbon dioxide is a byproduct of burning that carbon. And when you burn that carbon, it then oxidizes. It then reacts with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. And we have burned a lot of organic material. Believe it or not, the oil that goes into the gas that goes into your car is organic. And so by burning that, we have greatly increased our carbon dioxide concentrations. In the 1850s, so this is before the Civil War, this is before urbanization really was a thing, this is just as the Industrial Revolution was really getting going. Carbon dioxide concentrations were around 280 parts per million. Um, a good way to, to visualize this, imagine one million molecules of atmosphere. So take one million molecules out of the atmosphere, spread them out on a table, and count them all. Of those one million, 280 are carbon dioxide. Well, now we're actually over 400 parts per million. So we've actually increased from 280 parts per million to over 400 parts per million. Later this quarter, I'm going to talk about why this is so scary. But for now, just trust me, it's scary. Um, we've actually been able to monitor changes in carbon dioxide over the past 60 years in particular at a location called the Mauna Loa Observatory. Um, Mauna Loa is a volcano on the big island of Hawaii. Um, the Mauna Loa Observatory is 11,000 feet above the surface, high above any cities, out in the middle of the ocean. We want to do that because we want to take away all of that noise from the atmosphere, all of those little variations. And we just want to get a baseline of what's happening in the atmosphere. And this is what's happening in the atmosphere. What we've noticed is that carbon dioxide concentrations have steadily risen. And this is actually what's called the Keeling Curve. It's named after a gentleman from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography named David Keeling. And this was taken from the Mauna Loa Observatory. And what we've seen is that carbon dioxide concentrations are actually getting close to 410 parts per million now. And they just keep going up and going up and going up. Now one of the things you might notice from looking at this is that it's not necessarily a perfect line, but rather you get this zigzag. I like to call it Bart Simpson's hair or Lisa Simpson's hair. Um, it's got those spikes to it. Well, the reason why this happens is because of photosynthetic activity. We all know trees breathe in carbon dioxide. If you don't, hey, you just learned. Um, trees breathe in carbon dioxide. And as trees breathe in carbon dioxide, they remove it from the atmosphere. Well, for much of the world, trees are only active during spring and summer months. They shut down in the fall. When they shut down, they're not breathing in any carbon dioxide. As a result, concentrations go up. So usually where you see these upward ticks, these upward spikes like here, 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 and so on, those represent winter months, months where photosynthetic activity is low. On the other hand, if you look down here, you see these downward ticks, these little valleys, such as here, here, and here, these represent summers where photosynthetic activity has ramped up. One of the reasons why I really want to stress this is if you have somebody who is saying something misleading and trying to turn you off from climate change or trying to turn you off from carbon dioxide, they might say, oh, well, carbon dioxide concentrations have actually fallen in the last three months. Well, it's a, that's a natural cycle. It happens in spring and summer. So it's definitely something to look out for. Now, why is this increase so scary? Well, <clears throat> we can actually take a look at what's called ice core data. And 
we'll actually talk about ice core data towards the end of the quarter. And basically, ice core data is um, our ice cores are these long tubes of ice that go really deep beneath the surface. And we can actually use these to look at previous carbon dioxide concentrations. And if you actually take a look, carbon dioxide concentrations remained relatively constant through the 1700s and the 1800s. And it wasn't really until the mid 1800s and into the 20th century that we really saw the increase. And so this is why this is so concerning, because the increase that we've seen is substantial given the history of carbon dioxide. <clears throat> the last gas I'll talk about in this lecture is ozone. So ozone is usually seen as a good thing, and it is a good thing. Um, near the surface of the Earth, so down where we live, Ozone's actually a part of what's called photochemical smog. And photochemical smog is, um, is a bad thing. Uh, you can also experience ozone if you've ever stood next to a copy machine and you kind of get that sweet smell. Um, if you've ever watched The Simpsons, Ned Flanders writes off his taxes because of he likes the smell of it. He's like, I can't write it off on my taxes because I love the smell of it. Well, that smell is actually ozone. But the thing is, is that near the surface of the Earth, ozone is very unstable. It leaves the atmosphere almost as quickly as it enters the atmosphere. So we don't really have a lot of ozone down here. On the other hand, in our stratosphere, higher up in our atmosphere, ozone is crucial to sustaining life. And the reason why it's so crucial is because it actually absorbs harmful ultraviolet radiation. And this happens when you have oxygen molecules, which are, I'll pull up a pin here and write this. Um, you have oxygen molecules labeled O2, meaning it's uh, two molecules of oxygen that are bonded together. And they combine with rogue oxygen molecules to then give you ozone. Now, in order for them to do this, something needs to be present. Sunlight, in particular, needs to be present, particularly very high energy sunlight. And so, up in the stratosphere, those air molecules get first pick of sunlight before it comes down to the surface. So ozone is important because of that. <clears throat> uh, let me delete those changes. And um, yeah, ozone absorbs harmful UV radiation. And if this UV radiation reached the surface of the Earth, it could potentially cause mutations to humans. That would be a bad thing. So, ozone is good in the upper atmosphere. However, in the late 20th century, we actually reached a realization that ozone was actually a problem. And the reason why it was a problem was because there are certain pollutants, particularly what are called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, that when they got up into the stratosphere, they essentially ate away at ozone. They reacted, the o they reacted that rogue oxygen molecule and split it off. And when they did that, that depleted the ozone layer. And so we've seen this decline in the ozone layer over the last 40 years. But again, the ozone layer is essential because it allows for less harmful radiation, such as UVA radiation and visible light, to reach the surface of the Earth, but it absorbs all that harmful UVB and UVC radiation. So thankfully, the ozone layer keeps all the harmful stuff away, and the less harmful stuff is what reaches the surface of the Earth. Now, of course, 
UVA and, and the little bit of UVB that makes it to the surface can still cause problems, which is why you need to wear sunscreen. Well, ozone has had some pretty tough times recently. Um, with the increase in chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere, ozone concentrations have actually dropped. In particular, there's one part of the Earth, the, the polar southern hemisphere, um, this is the area over Antarctica, where the dynamics of the atmosphere combined with the temperature in the stratosphere makes it perfect for what are called polar stratospheric clouds. So the temperature inside the stratosphere gets cold enough to allow for these polar stratospheric clouds, and these things react with CFCs to just obliterate ozone. And thankfully though, these, these polar stratospheric clouds are only present during early to mid-spring in the southern hemisphere. So September, October, November, that's really the bad time for the ozone hole. Um, here's the good news though. Over the last 30 years, we've realized that this is becoming a problem. And so all of the nations around the world agreed no more CFCs. And so CFC concentrations have reduced and ozone concentrations are going back up. The ozone layer is repairing. And it's actually believed that we're going to be to pre-Montreal protocol levels by the 1950 or by the by the year 2050. So it's actually a good thing. We're in good shape there. Now in the next lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about the layers of the atmosphere. But here's just a quick review of what we talked about here. Um, first off, the atmosphere is the envelope of air that surrounds Earth. Gravity holds it in place. Um, the most abundant gas, so the gas that has the highest concentration in the atmosphere, is nitrogen. Um, the second most is oxygen. And then these greenhouse gases are a good thing in that they trap in heat, keeping us warm. However, too much of a good thing is happening now, and so now we're getting runaway warming. Um, and then finally, ozone is important in our upper atmosphere. And we're going to talk specifically about that layer called the stratosphere in the next lecture. So until then, thank you for watching.